comment and put a question myself. Having negotiated with the Israelis in the past and followed their negotiations uh, thereafter, they've always insisted on bilateral negotiations. Even when the Americans were leading the, trying to be the honest broker, so to speak, between the two, when meetings were held between the Israelis and the Arab part, they didn't want the Americans in the room, and they didn't want the Egyptians in the room. We hosted the interim agreements here in Heliopolis, and I remember I went to the first meeting to open it, and the Israelis said, but you can't attend the meeting. And I said, well, that's very difficult because we're the hosts. So uh, anyway, we found a compromise. I opened the meeting, we started it, and then we let them negotiate bilaterally. Martin Indyk, writing recently about his efforts with John Kerry, uh, also mentioned that the Israelis would take messages from the Americans, but always wanted to negotiate directly with the, Isra with the Palestinians would ne without an American being inside the room if negotiations started. So that, that Israel would accept to go to Camp David in spite of its hesitations isn't really that surprising, although I, I agree with you, Bill, a bit suspicious of having the Americans in there with all the uh, value that the American presence had. Uh, but the, the attractiveness of being able to sign a peace agreement with Egypt was sort of, I think, the pull factor there. What I'm not sure of is when did Carter actually decide that it's better to go the Camp David approach? Uh, I remember as a young cadet at the foreign ministry writing a thesis for our institute here about Carter as a potential candidate. And he used the word homeland in the campaign. That's right, he did. Even before becoming president. And I made this point that this is the first time I see an American actually talking about a homeland. We use state, but that's, that's uh, not the issue. It, it was, so he was committed to a Palestinian state. But he also, and, and we discussed this last night, at least a, a, one of his advisors says that he was very interested in a comprehensive solution and didn't actually initially want bilateral talks specifically. He wasn't, he wasn't comfortable with the possible visit of Sadat to, to Jerusalem. So what made him change that position? Or frankly, was Camp David an American idea, an Egyptian idea, or an Israeli idea to start off with? And if I may also, I'm, I'm not clear on this. There was several disagreements at the end of Camp David. One of them was on this issue of settlements. The other was there's still some ambiguity about what actually was done on Jerusalem. <laughs> what did the Americans commit themselves to on Jerusalem? And what was the reaction of either the Egyptian and the, uh, and the, and the, American, and the, excuse me, the Israeli side? Uh, I'll just put them out there. I'll take questions from the floor. We'll take three uh, questions at the time and allow the uh, panelists to respond. Any questions from the floor? Father, please. Dr. Arabi, please first. Only on Jerusalem. The American position when we entered Camp David was very clear on Jerusalem. The United Nations resolutions were clear. Israel does not have any, uh, not, cannot change the status of Jerusalem and cannot have any territory in Jerusalem. Very clear. Camp David, with the letter of uh, Carter, diluted that, as I referred to earlier. Uh, a president of a country says the position of my government is what uh, Arthur Gorbik, Ambassador Arthur Gorbik said in 1967 in the General Assembly, and what Ambassador uh, Yost, I forgot his first name, said in the Security Council in 1969. You have diluted your position. There was a question, gentleman in the back, yes. Could you please introduce yourself and speak loudly? Thank you. Hi. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks to both of you, uh, all three of you uh, today. Um, I was just wondering, uh, recently in the news, um, I mean, because after Camp David, we also saw um, an agreement with Jordan. But recently in the news, there's been discussion of maybe a Saudi-Israeli uh, negotiations and the Abu Dis plan and things like that. 
Um, I was wondering what lessons do you think Camp David brings for other bilateral peace agreements between Arab states and Israel, and particularly how much you know, uh, finessing must be done with the Palestinian issue, with Jerusalem, in order to achieve peace that's acceptable to both sides. Any other questions? Professor Marazzi. Um, my question is mainly about Gaza in, in the Camp David, because it seemed for me like weird. Uh, if Egypt wanted just a separate peace, uh, Gaza was taken from Egyptian army and didn't mean a lot for ideological point of view for begging for uh, Judea and Samaria or whatever. That is not the West Bank. So was it Sadat who wanted to just get rid of any Arab business, Palestinian whatsoever? Or was it something that debated? It's not clear what happened in regard to Gaza if Egypt wanted to re just to get back what was taken from the Egyptian army in 67. Thank you. Thank you. One last question in this round. Okay, why don't I give the panelists a chance to answer these questions and then we'll make, do another round. Bill, do you want to start? Sure. Um, uh, Dean Fahmi asked <clears throat> when uh, Carter moved away from his more comprehensive approach to thinking that uh, a more bilateral Egyptian-Israeli agreement was probably all that we could achieve, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I, I think there were two moments when we, when Carter reassessed. One of them I'm quite sure of. Uh, after uh, Sadat went to Jerusalem in November of 1977 without telling us in advance that he was planning to do so. Uh, this was not coordinated by the Americans. It was not suggested by us. President Carter at one time said he had suggested it to President Sadat. I don't actually think that's true. This was Sadat's idea of how to do something dramatic that would break what seemed to be an impasse at that time. But it made us think about whether it still made sense to keep talking about going to Geneva and getting an Arab delegation that consisted of Syrians and Palestinians and Jordanians. It all seemed like that was not going to come together after Egypt had already made this direct overture to the Israelis. And indeed, it, it, it lost whatever credibility it had very quickly. So I remember writing a memo shortly after President Sadat had gone to Jerusalem saying, we need to start rethinking our own uh, assumptions and our own strategy. And it's clear now that the Egyptian-Israeli track is going to go much faster than the others. It doesn't mean we have to ignore the others, but we're now going to see a lot of attention and need to pay a lot of attention to that. And Sadat wants us to pay attention to it because he's now put himself out on a limb and needs to get some results fairly quickly, or he's going to look like he made a big concessions for nothing. And we were pretty sure that Begin would not respond, as Sadat had hoped, with a generous offer saying, oh, President Sadat, on behalf of the Arab world, has offered us peace. We will respond by offering to return land to all the Arab countries if they agree to make peace with us. There was no chance in the world that Begin was going to do that, although I do believe there was a moment when Sadat thought that the response of the Israeli public to his visit would bring about a change in Israeli policy. And we had to go back and tell him, you don't understand Begin. He will come back and still argue over every word in every document and every comma and the spelling, and he'll drive you crazy. He drives us crazy, but he'll drive you even crazier because you have no capacity for patience with the details like he does. Anyway, that was the beginning. And then I think, as I mentioned, <clears throat> when Sadat and Carter met in early 78, Carter came away with the impression and I don't know what was said. There's no record of this. And Carter doesn't remember it. I've asked him. But he started talking to his team about we have to get prepared for the completion of the Egyptian-Israeli negotiations. As part of a broader approach to Arab-Israeli peace, but that's the point he kept emphasizing. 
And when we went to Camp David, it was clear to me that that was what he thought we could achieve with a little bit of window dressing for the Palestinians. So I think it was the combination of Sadat going to Jerusalem and then for the first time that they met after Sadat had been to Jerusalem, he must have left Carter with the impression that at a minimum I have to get my territory back if you can get me anything more from this madman Begin. And he talked about Begin that way. You know, he said, I've, he'd met him in Ismailia and they'd had a very bad meeting, although Sadat was polite and didn't insult him in public. But after the meeting, he said, I can't deal with this man. I don't want to have anything to do with him anymore. If, if you can get him to be more reasonable on the Palestinian issue, with this self-rule thing, he said, well, it's nothing. There's nothing there which was a little bit our impression as well. Anyway, I think that was how we began to move toward more emphasis on the Egyptians, really. Just briefly, what about Jerusalem in the context of the Camp David Accords? In all honesty, because this was largely a detailed framework about the Egyptian-Israeli agreement, and the rest was pretty much generalities about the Palestinians, we had not spent much time talking about Jerusalem. We knew that the positions of Egypt, Israel, and the United States were, I mean, the United States and Egypt basically saw the issues pretty much the same way. We did not recognize the annexation of, of East Jerusalem, and we had said it in these two statements at the Security Council, but there was no part of the drafts of Camp David that included the word Jerusalem. And the very last minute, it was the Egyptians who said, we, we can't have a document on Arab-Israeli peace that doesn't mention Jerusalem at all. So we went to the Israelis and we said, we need to make a statement about Jerusalem. And Begin said, in that case, I won't sign because our views and are not the same as yours. And there's no common position. So we simply won't sign the Camp David agreements if it mentions the word Jerusalem in anything other than, you're not going to accept our position, our Israeli position. So let's just leave it out. So Carter's compromise was each party would as an appendix to Camp David. You read the Camp David Accords, there's no mention of Jerusalem. In an appendix, each party states their position on Jerusalem. There is an Israeli statement that it's theirs by right. It's been annexed. There's no negotiation over it. There's the Egyptian statement that is different from that, that you know, its future has to be negotiated and has to, there has to be a recognition of Arab and Palestinian Muslim rights in Jerusalem. And the Americans do what is politically convenient. They confirm their prior position, which the Israelis hated. In fact, they said, if you Americans write that President Carter's view is that uh, East Jerusalem uh, must become part of, it must be part of a future Palestinian state or anything like that, we won't sign this document. So he finally said, well, that happens to be our position, that it's not Israeli. It should either go to Jordan or Palestinians in some future settlement. But we'll say that by referring to prior statements at the Security Council. Yes, it was a bit cowardly, but it didn't change the substance of our position. But otherwise, I think we took seriously that Begin might simply refuse to sign. Now, was that credible that in Dean Fahmy asked this earlier, was it credible that any of the parties at Camp David would say, this isn't working, we're walking home, we're going home? And unfortunately, I think the answer is for Begin, yes. The only party who could have said, I went into this with my doubts that I thought the Americans and the Egyptians are going to gang up on little old Israel and force us to accept things that are contrary to our fundamental policies. And we have stood up to them and you know, with respect, we have told them we don't agree and we're leaving. And he could have gone home and his party would have applauded him. And most other Israelis would have said, well, that was probably the best thing to do. What's the rush anyway? And life would have gone on for the Israelis pretty much as it had been before. They were in control of the territories. Lack of peace was not painful for them. I don't think Sadat's threat to leave when he made it, the one credible moment that uh, he threatened to take his delegation out, was in fact all that credible. I think for him it would be a huge political setback. Not so much at home. He could have gone back a hero saying, I stood up to the Israelis, to the Americans, you know, blah, blah, blah. But 
his territory would have still been occupied. And the other part, we haven't talked enough about this. Sadat didn't really care all that much about having peace with Israel. He wanted his territory back, but he didn't have any illusion that peace would mean that Israelis and Egyptians would travel back and forth and get to know each other and fall in love and trade and all of that. That was, might happen, might not, but what he wanted was the peace with Israel would open the door to a different relationship with the United States which would mean that his gamble of cutting ties with the Russians, which was, he was in the process of doing, would be offset by a new relationship with the United States. He'd be getting aid and arms and all of this, and he had a, an exaggerated notion of what American technology could do and American science. And you know, if you'd ever ask him about Egypt's economic development, he said, ah, oh, once we have this new relationship, you will fix my economy for me, and you will do this. And, you know, he wasn't a detailed person about the economy, but he did believe that the new relationship would mean new investment and all kinds of positive things for Egypt. And I think he realized that when he contemplated walking out of Camp David, that it would cost him the relationship with the United States and the relationship with Carter. Carter told him, if you leave, it will be the end of our relationship between the two countries, because I won't be able to explain why you left and it will be th the end of our personal relationship. That was a threat he could not make to Menachem Begin, but he made it to Sadat. If you leave, it's over between us. Begin would have gone home and lobbied Congress and told why he had left, and he would have been fine. In terms of the relationship with the United States, Carter wasn't going to be president forever. He didn't care whether he had good relations with him. But he, and, and Sadat didn't have that. He didn't have Although he was respected by American public opinion, he didn't have that kind of lock in Congress or lock with the American media or foreign policy establishment that any Israeli prime minister has, which tells you something about the different kind of influence that Carter could exercise over Israel and over Egypt. Um, just briefly on the question, I'll, I won't go on much longer. Lessons of Camp David for future negotiations. You know, we, we made mistakes at Camp David. I mentioned not getting the settlements thing pinned down. But we took seriously that for an American president or secretary of state to play the role of mediator between two parties who have fundamentally different positions, you have to be really well informed and really well prepared. This is not a game for amateurs or sissies. It's hard work. At some point, you're going to have to force parties to make tough decisions. You have to make tough decisions of your own. And you have to be very, very well informed. At one point, Azar Weitzman turned to me during the negotiations and said, your president is not going to let us fail. And let me tell you, he knows more about most of the substantive issues than I do. And I've lived with this problem all my life. Now, I, well, that was an exaggeration. But it was true that the two or three successful times the United States has brokered negotiations, Henry Kissinger, Carter, Jim Baker. These were people who had mastered the details of the conflict and could talk credibly with both sides. Now, the idea that Jared Kushner and the team that works on the peace process has anything like the seriousness of background. In fact, at one point, Jared Kushner, Kushner said, I don't read books about the past, especially not ones about Camp David. He didn't say that, but just about all the previous efforts. Because they all failed. There's nothing to learn from them. We're going to do this in a totally new way and by some magical process, everybody will agree. If this works, I will, will be astonished. I think it is, in fact, they know it's not going to work, so they're not presenting any plan. So this notion that there is some great plan, Abu Dis is the new Jerusalem, I mean, frankly, Give me a break. It's true that many people no longer care about the details of this, but the Palestinians do, and the Jordanians do, and some Saudis do, and some Egyptians do. Anybody who knows even the slightest thing about the Palestinian issue knows that if you take Jerusalem completely off the table for the Palestinians, there is no deal. And that's what they're trying to do. In fact, they take pride in saying, well, by moving the American embassy to Jerusalem, we took it off the negotiating table. It's totally nonsense. 
in the minds of the people who care about this on the Arab side, it's still an issue that has to be resolved. It's not as if unilaterally the Americans say, this no longer matters, this no longer matters. So, so believe me, the current administration's view that this is an easy deal of the century to make because we have this great deal-making president and that you don't have to know anything about the Middle East, you just have to know, find somebody's price. That's what you do in the world of real estate. You don't have to know your adversary, you just have to figure out what kind of price you can make. Um, I don't think you can buy your way to Palestinian-Israeli peace. Now, of course, if you could, it would be nice to have the Saudis in there saying, yes, we'll help pay for it and all the rest. And that's the illusion that they have that the Saudis no longer care about the Arab-Israeli conflict, they care about Iran, so you can get them into the game as a kind of co-conspirator to put pressure on uh, the Palestinians, pretend that you'll turn Gaza into the future Dubai of you know, the Mediterranean. It's all never, never land. Either that or I'm totally out of touch with some wonderful new form of diplomacy that will soon be sprung upon us. But I, I, I think anybody who has spent as much time as we have, and Shalit Talhami and Frank Giordani, on the real diplomacy of the Arab Israeli conflict, we have no confidence in this new approach and don't think anything will come of it. Now, I'd love to be proved wrong, but I don't think I will be. Um, Gaza was mentioned, last point. Gaza was not discussed specifically at Camp David. It had been previously, and it was sometimes afterwards. There were times when there would be hints from Begin, he said, if the Egyptians would accept some kind of a deal on Gaza only, but not as a precedent for what would happen in the West Bank, we might be interested, including maybe giving it back to them. They didn't particularly want Gaza. They did want Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. So we got a hint from Begin that if you're talking about Gaza only, maybe. But if it's Gaza and the West Bank, or Gaza as a precedent for the West Bank, forget it. They're not, that's, that's a non-starter. So by the time we got to Camp David, this had been floated. Uh, Sadat had not been tempted, although I think there was a little bit of discussion about whether something could be done on Gaza. But by the time we got to Camp David, there was no Gaza separate discussion that I'm aware of. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Arbi, do you want to comment on any of these questions? Yes, uh, I'll come to the last one. Oh, Deal of the century, as they say. <clears throat> and it's a question to Bill. Uh, is there uh, some kind of uh, an agreement within the, uh, those working in foreign policy uh, to oppose in articles, in uh, newspapers and conferences, uh, the, the idea of the deal of the century? Have there been some action there on the part of the intelligentsia, let's say, in the United States? Um, I think there, you know, first we don't know what this so-called plan consists of, although there have been quite a few leaks that, uh, from one side or the other from their the briefing that they've gotten. So there's nothing yet tangible. but. At least the circles I move in and what I've read in the American press, there, there's a great deal of skepticism that there is anything substantial. I mean, the, the rough outlines of what seems to be in store, and Jared Kushner apparently was quoted telling one group that, you know, the Palestinians have to understand they're like in a real estate deal, they're in bankruptcy, and they can't expect a very good deal. Well, you know, that is a model for how you might think about this, but I think it, the Palestinians may have a weak hand, but it doesn't mean they're just ready to say, okay, if we can have a Palestinian state in 5% of the West Bank, that will satisfy us. So they're being offered something like 20%, per, the, the so-called Area C that they now ostensibly control will be their state. Um, the Jordan Valley for the next 20 years will be under Jordan, Israeli control. Uh, the other areas will still remain under Israeli control with the possibility of some evolution of greater Palestinian control over time. Um, the Palestinians will gi be given this little capital capitalette in Abu Dis on the edge of Jerusalem, but 
not in Jerusalem, and khalas, that's it. No refugees, uh, compensation, no anything else. Now, plus lots of money, you know, lots of money for reconstruction, rebuilding Gaza, blah, 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 as if that will offset the... Now, if that's the outline of it, and that's the only thing we've heard from the various leaks that have come so far, um, everybody who's heard that says it's a non-starter. It's dead on arrival. And I think that's why they haven't presented it. It's, you know, Palestinians were rejected. Most of us who have been in the business will say it's, it's crazy to think it. Even people like you know, Dennis Ross and Martin Indyk, who worked uh, in, the, in the Clinton period on these issues are saying, and who are quite sympathetic to the Israelis, are saying, if that's what they have in mind, it's not going to work. You know, they're, they're overdoing their embracing of the hardline Israeli positions. You can't be a credible mediator if you're only taking one side of this. So I don't think there's any constituency for this, except among, you know, the more politicized elements of the evangelical community and the really hardline uh, pro-Israeli groups who say, you know, Palestinians should take what's offered because it only gets worse for them. The longer they wait, the less they're going to get. So if they want something, they better seize it now, even if it's much less than they were offered by Clinton or could have gotten at any other time. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody here thinks it's going to work, but I'd be very interested in hearing the defense of that. Thank you, Bill. Dr. Harvey wanted to say something? Yes. yes. I will make a just a question. The text itself, <laughs> the, the solution from the negotiations must also recognize the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people and the just requirements. Right. People. Right. Just requirements. Right. In this way, the Palestinians will participate in the determination of their own future, of their own future. Through then, uh, this could have easily been improved and uh, it would have been acceptable. You know, the, the words can be interpreted in a way that says that suggests that the Palestinians should participate, that they have rights, not defined, unfortunately, not national rights. It doesn't say the right to self-determination, it says rights. Well, you can... And that they have the right to participate in the determination of their own future, not to determine their own future, but to participate along with others. So this was, this was what I'm saying, that the wording can be read one way. This is what diplomacy often leads you to, is one side says, you know, there's positive content there that can be compatible with a notion of Palestinian participation, self-determination, statehood, so forth. Or there's a reading of it that says, none of that is guaranteed. It's hinted at. But there's no definition of what the rights are. Other people are also participating in that determination of their future, including the Israelis. And so that's the problem with the text. It lends itself to too many different interpretations. Whereas the text on the Egyptian side says Israel will withdraw to the international border within three years. That's an understandable sentence, you know, provided that the security arrangements and the peace arrangements, everything goes into effect. Uh, you can read that document and say, okay, I understand. The Egyptians will do this. The Israelis will do this. The Americans have promised this. It's all very straightforward. You read the Palestinian part and say, well, it could mean this. It could mean that. They're not, the Palestinians weren't there. The Jordanians aren't there. There are all these roles being assigned to them without their prior agreement. Uh, we know the Israelis don't agree to an outcome that would be acceptable to them at this point. How do you get from where we are today to where it might look more like peace? And it doesn't, there's nothing in the document that answers that. That's the problem with it. Thank you, Bill. Three questions from the floor, Dr. Kudmani, a uh, gentleman over here, and Dr. Mona at the end. And then we're going to have to close because time is up. Dr. Kudmani, today. Financial 
But because the relationship was uh, different and uh, President Carter could uh, put some threats uh, to uh, uh, Sadat but not to Begin. But uh, in general, that, uh, what, when did the uh, financial component of aid come in and was it at all tied to any conditions? Thank you. Excuse me, I speak Arabic, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-Sada al-Afadil a'da al-Munassa. Al-Sada al-Afadil al-Hudur. Ana Kamal Shaheen, wakil awal wazart al-Maliyya al-Sabiq. Wa min al-Gil illa hadar al-Tifaqiyat kambi David wa al-Kalam illa aliyah sawa ablaha aw ba'daha. Bas ana aiz adif ba'd استراتيجي لكامب ديفيد في 78 وبعد 40 سنة في نظري وتقديري الخاص وممكن أكون خاطئ أن الاتفاقية تكتيكيا كانت لهدف وقف الحرب لكن استراتيجيا فاشلة لأن الصراع كما هو والمشكلة كما هي بعد أربعين سنة وبعدين في 78 كان البعد العربي والإسرائيلي هو كفتي الميزان الآن القضية بقى لها بعد عربي وإسرائيلي وبعد إقليمي وبعد دولي فالمشكلة تعقدت طب إيه الحل أنا أرى أن النخبة في إسرائيل والنخبة في العرب والنخبة في العالم الإقليمي والعالم الدولي يبقى في اجتماع في جنيف مثلا أو في مكان آخر لحل هذا الصراع يبقى فيه سلام شامل حقيقي في منطقة الشرق الأوسط منطقة الشرق الأوسط دلوقتي ملتهبة جدا والقضية القضية الفلسطينية عمود فقري فيها فأنا أدعو إلى مؤتمر دولي عالمي في النخب المحلية والإقليمية والدولية لحل هذا الصراع حل شامل لصالح الشعوب كلها الشعب الإسرائيلي والشعب العربي والشعوب كلها شكرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا دكتور منى Thank you. My name is Mona Makram Abed. Bill, it's a great pleasure to see you here and to listen to you. Uh, you said earlier on that the Palestinians should take what there is, otherwise there will be no other offer. Uh, can we say today that Americans, uh, Egyptians, and the Gulf states are today putting a lot of their weight behind Mohammed Dahlan as a replacement of Mahmoud Abbas? Uh, and is this part of the deal of the century? Thank you. Last question. Uh, thank you, and again, it's a pleasure to see all three of you here on the panel. Um, and you were all first-hand participant in Camp David. Salah Muntasar this morning in Al-Ahram, in his column in Al-Ahram, said that the main obstacle during the Camp David and the peace negotiation was the Soviet Union. <laughs> and he gave his reasons why the Soviet Union was the main obstacle. But my question really has to do with another issue that keeps hanging over without being settled. Are there any secret parts to Camp David or to the peace negotiation that we don't know about? Because that keeps coming up. Every now and then, people make that allegation. Is there any? Thank you. 
Thank you. I'll let the panelists, uh, I'm sorry, there's no time. We only have seven minutes left and they have a chance to answer. Bill and then Dr. Arby. Uh, <clears throat> very quickly, on the financial dimensions of Camp David that um, Basma asked about, uh, amazingly, there wasn't much discussion of things like aid during Camp David itself. Uh, it was almost as if it was beneath Sadat's dignity to get into bargaining over aid and things like that. Carter, at some point, I believe, but cannot testify firsthand, had said to Sadat, once you make peace with Israel, our relationship with you will be like our relationship with Israel. Some of my Egyptian colleagues were told by Sadat that that meant the exact level of aid that we give to Israel will be given to you, which I don't think Carter ever said. But he did say that we'll have a comparable relationship if you make peace. But at Camp David, I don't believe that Sadat and Carter ever discussed that. Um, the Israelis asked when we said you're going to have to remove your airfields from Sinai, they said, can you help with the costs? Because it's going to cost us money to do that. And we said, we can make you a loan. And I think it was three, three billion dollars. Three million? Three hundred million? I don't know. Three hundred million. Was it? Was it, it was a non-trivial amount. Hmm? Three hundred million? Yeah, three hundred million. Um, and Begin accepted. Almost immediately after signing the Camp David Accords, Begin came to us and said, oh, you know, my English isn't very good. And when I asked, when I accepted the loan that you offered, I thought you were offering it as a grant. And we didn't understand that we would have to repay this. So I assume this was just a misunderstanding. And Carter said, no, you asked for a loan. I gave you a loan. You're going to repay it. Now, later, the Reagan administration you know, forgave the repayment. But Carter did offer the loan and did pay it and um, uh, didn't cave in on that. But there wasn't a lot of discussion uh, about aid, in all honesty. Now, after, prior to the signing of the peace treaty, there was more discussion of, you know, when can we expect to start discussions on this and so forth, more at the ministerial level. But it was not a key ingredient at Camp David. Um, Dr. Mona, nice to see you. Um, she, uh, I think, I hope you didn't think that I was saying that the Palestinians should take these little crumbs from the table and accept it because it will just get worse. But that seems to be the attitude of the Trump administration. They have a weak hand. They better take what they can get before people simply say, this issue is off the table entirely. Uh, the whole Dahlan replacing Abu Mazen, I honestly don't know. It's obviously... Uh, there are things going on that keep getting reported as if there's some movement to reorganize Palestinian leadership. Uh, I simply don't have any insight onto that, and I'm not sure at the end of the day what difference it would make. I mean, the Israelis are not going to say, oh, thank goodness we have uh, Dahlan to deal with on the Palestinian side. Now we're going to make concessions that we'd never imagined making before. I mean, it's not that Abu Mazen is the most hardline Palestinian they can imagine. He may be weak, he may be indecisive, but he's not, you know, a fire-breathing radical. In fact, he once said, I come from, uh, so, uh, what's his hometown? Uh, uh, Safa. Uh, and I expect to be able to go back there as a Palestinian citizen, but not to go back to my home, to live there. I understand that. Our, my right of return does not mean I'm going to go back to my home uh, where I grew up. Uh, if I were an Israeli, I would say that's a pretty remarkable statement for the president of the Palestinian Authority to make, uh, that, that the right of return does not have to literally mean the right to return to our home. And I will, as the president of the Palestinian Authority, say that I don't expect to go back to my own hometown. I do expect to have recognized that I lost certain things and I have other rights, but it's not that Abu Mazen is a hardliner, it's that nobody believes he can deliver on anything these days. So does it make a difference if we have Dothan or you know, Hamas gets kind of enthroned as the new leadership of the Palestinian Authority? The current Israeli government will not give an inch, as far as I can tell, to any one of these Palestinian leaders. 
So this search for the Palestinian leader who will somehow provide the key to a new dynamic of peacemaking, I think it's illusory. Um, Dr. Saad's question, are there any secrets? If they are, they're kept from me. I've gone through the files. I was there. I've Carter is not a very dishonest man. In fact, he's probably one of the men with greater integrity than most others. He doesn't say there are any secrets. Um, you know, uh, if there were any side understandings that were written down, I would have seen them at some point, and there are none of those. If there were things that people said and left impressions that influenced decisions, but honestly, I think the story's known. Uh, there's, there's nothing new to be said that, that will change our assessment of it. And the, as far as I could understand, and did me, help me, the idea that Camp David was a tactical success but strategically flawed, yes, it did not achieve everything that we would have hoped in terms of settling the conflicts of the Middle East. Could it have? Um, not by itself, but if you had had different leadership in Israel, uh, perhaps different leadership in certain Arab countries, there's nothing in Camp David per se, except taking Egypt out of the conflict, which changes the balance of power. So it makes it harder for the other Arab states then to negotiate because the weight of Egypt is, is missing from the equation, but it doesn't make it impossible. In fact, I believe that in the Clinton period, when Rabin was prime minister, they came fairly close on the Syrian front to reaching the understanding. Uh, Rabin said he would return the Golan Heights in their entirety in return for peace and security. That's the formula that worked in Camp David. Now, it didn't happen, but it could have, but, but uh, Rabin was assassinated, and his successor was unable or uninterested in making it work. Uh, could something have been worked out on the Palestinian front? The closest we got was Clinton at Camp David. It wasn't a very convincing framework that they came up with. Uh, but again, if in an earlier period, in the early 90s, uh, when Arafat was stronger and when there was more momentum behind the idea of peace, could some of the ideas of Camp David been taken and adapted to the new realities and provided the base for a Palestinian state with an Israeli leadership willing to withdraw from the West Bank and East Jerusalem and recognize Palestinian national rights? It, it, it could have been uh, used as a base. And Egypt would have supported it. The rest of the Arab world would have supported it. So I don't think it was Camp David as a document that ensured that everything that followed on the rest of the peace process was a failure. But it was the, the, the geostrategic reality of taking Egypt out of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which Sadat did knowingly, that changed the dynamics of the rest of the conflict. Thank you, Dr. Arabi. Yes, just uh, a word. Uh, in negotiation with Israel, and I have had, uh, I don't know how to say the chance or the, uh, to negotiate with the Israeli delegation for 15 years, 15 years. Even if you have a document, in their negotiation, they will always try to change it. And they want to extend time, always to extend time. And use the time to change. Uh, even the, the Camp David uh, part on the Palestinians, self rule or self government, uh, with its defects, it became gradually worse and worse under time. They always do that on everything. Uh, I mean, they say they entered the territories in uh, six hours. It took them eight years or ten years to get out. Uh, the treaty was uh, supposed to be implemented in three, I don't know why three years, and then five years to, let, uh, to get out of the strip of land in Taba. Uh, they always want time. I asked one of them once, informally. I said, we, we seek, after we agree on something, after they negotiate and reach an agreement, they always try to seek and have 
panels working and research groups and so on, how they can get out of here and get out of there. And I think you have noticed that very definitely. Uh, so uh, I don't think there is any possibility to revive what was there under the present circumstance. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Dr. Arabi, very much. This was very insightful. Uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Uh, Orani to come back to the floor and tell us about the next part of the program. But I want to thank the audience for their very interesting questions as well. Thank you. I think that was, that was clear. Well, you just wanted to say what I wanted actually to announce. I want to thank uh, Dean Fahmi, Dr. Quant, Dr. Al Arabi, for a very frank inside view of what has taken place 40 years ago. I have noticed lots of people have raised their hands and didn't have the chance to ask their questions. In the next session, they will have a priority. But for the moment, we will have half an hour of coffee break. Thank you again very much. Actually, it says 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Well, 15 minutes. We have to be quick. <laughs> Just one, one moment, because I forgot to, to show. If someone has not seen the, uh, pro the, <clears throat> the project uh, for Camp David submitted by Egypt, which would which include everything. I mean, I'm willing to give it to you. I mean, if someone would like to have a look at it, it, all what Egypt wanted was there, but we couldn't get it. Uh, uh, Nabil, we have to take a photo.